welcome to Tell Us Like. It is a, a chat show wherein we get to know the person behind the personality. You know, I once read this somewhere that we know very many people who have made it to the top of the heap, so to speak. What was interesting is very few of them actually start off with that in mind. What they do start off is doing stuff that they're passionate about, stuff that they love. And I have with me today someone who fits that bill really to a nicety. Social influencer, you know, creator, concept creator, you can give her very many labels. I'd like to call her Malini Agarwal, a dear friend, or Miss Malini as she is known. Malini, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's quite a landmark moment for me too. I mean, I sort of entered the industry and you've always been, you know, been one of the pillars of it. So it's such a delight to be here. Yeah, that's a mutual sentiment. Thank you again. So Malini, you know, like I said, we, we chat with people like you and, and get to know the person behind the personality, sure. like I said. So I'm going to roll back the years. Let's start at the very beginning, as a song once said. Yeah. And, and figure bits of your life, your growing up years. So all the songs you used to listen to at the ghetto. Right? There you <laughs> go. You remember that. Uh, listen, by the way, no giving out any state secrets about me, okay? I know. I I'm a well-behaved. Make them read my blog gent. for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, feel free. Feel free to say all the nasty things you wish to say. Uh, I've gotten used to it. But take us back. Take us back to the early years. So it's pretty crazy. You know, it almost feels like another life, to be honest, because my father was a career diplomat. So by the time I came around, I'm the youngest of four. So by the time I came around, he was pretty senior. So he was the Indian, Indian ambassador when I was right. around. And I was born in Allahabad, just like Amit Um uh, But when I was six months old, I was whisked away to Somalia. We lived in Somalia for three oh. years, but I was really young. So I don't remember much. Um, I just have like little anecdotes my sister told me about living there. And then we moved to Germany. So in fact, when I was growing up, I was fluent in uh, Hindi and German before I spoke English because I went to a German school because when the foreign service, they let you put two kids, um, you know, in the American school and then you have to pay for the rest. And my classic Indian parents are not going to pay for a third <laughs> and fourth child. To be... So it was great, but unfortunately, nobody kept it up with me. So all I remember is a poem about a duck. Uh, it's just very underwhelming. Um, but so that was the beginning. And then we moved to Greece for three years and came back to India. So I went to modern school, Raghu, Raghu Beer Singh for a while, and then a modern, modern Barakamba. And then again, we got posted out. So we went to live in Ivory Coast. Uh, so I picked up a little French there. Uh, and then my father got posted to Bulgaria. Now, Bulgaria didn't have a high school for me. So, you know, all my dreams of uh, finishing high school at an American school. And I wanted to go to the American University of Paris, like my brother did. Uh, and study theater and uh, that never happened. I came back and I went to the British school in Delhi and, and growing up, I literally, I guess I was that classic spoiled diplo brat, really, because I didn't know any better, right? You're trying I, to tell me that you aren't spoiled anymore? No, I'm not. Now I'm much better now. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you say so yourself. Even if I say so myself, because I've seen, I know what I was like. So I, was, I, I remember because, you know, if, you, if you're brought up in this environment where, you know, your house has a tennis court and a swimming pool and you're in, driven to school in a Mercedes every day, you're not going to have a realistic awareness of life. Sure. And I and the way I remember very clearly, I was 17 years old uh, when my father, you know, was posted in Ivory Coast. So I came back to Mayur Vihar, Delhi, <laughs> I, the IFS colony. And I walked into this like, tiny two-bedroom apartment. And I was like, mom, this is so cute. Where's the rest of it? Where's the pool? She goes, there's no pool. Sit down. So, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? And then, of course, you know, and then I was a full 360 trajectory where my parents are very particular about everyone must be self-made, you know. Uh, because they were born in, you know, in Alabad and my father's fully, like he's passed away now, but fully self-made, you know, taught himself everything, did a PhD in Sanskrit, oh, like, unnecessarily nice. very academic. Uh, my eldest brother, you know, he built an so insurance software company, sold it to a Dutch bank for six million Deutschmark oh, back good. in like the late 80s. My sister got a full scholarship to Cambridge. Um, and then I was like, now I was like, I'm going to do something. I don't know what. And um, tough acts to follow. Very tough acts to follow. My other brother is a little bit of a disaster. So it's not. So, I'm kidding. Oh, I must, he's in advertising. I must meet him. He's, so you he's, know, he's I'm he's the president great, no, of was, that club. He's uh, you know uh, the creative director for you know various different ad agencies over right. the years. So it's been like really a tough act to follow. But so when we came back to Delhi, I was it was a little bit of a culture shock for me, frankly, because I'd grown up in these different environments, and um, a couple of things happened. So one, I remember being nine years old in Greece. And someone, and these are things that have stayed with me, right? So someone in school asked me if I go to school on an elephant. 
And I was like, now when I look back, I'm like, that would be amazing. That, mean, that would make me straight up royalty if I'm rocking up to school. On another. <laughs> but at that point, you know, it was just the ignorance of not knowing or, or people being surprised that, oh, your English is so good. These little things, because, sure. you know, this is like back in the 80s when you probably didn't. I was probably the only Indian kid in that class. Right. Um, so all of this kind of stayed with me. And then when I came back to Delhi, I, I went to the British school where suddenly now everything is spelled with an S and not a Z. And my American accent is like very heavy and everyone's wondering why I have one. And, you know, it's a strong accent that sticks with you. So everyone's sure. like, are you from America? I'm like, no, I've never lived there. They're like, then why do you have an accent? I'm like, it's the school. What do I tell you? Like, I don't know how to explain myself. And then so I did my a level. So suddenly I went from being like this honor roll student, top honors, like I topped every class because, you know, when you go from a little bit of Indian academics, you're just hyper intelligent there. And, and so it really rounded out my personality because I also learned to think for myself. Right. But then I came back and I did my A-levels in um, English history. And then I thought of doing it in French, which was a terrible idea because suddenly I got to A-levels in French. Like I could barely say anything. So I dropped that and then I struggled. I really struggled with my A-levels. Um, and then I also struggled with living in, in Delhi in suddenly. Delhi. Yeah. And then after that, um, so the results for my school, most of the kids from the British school really wealthy family. So then they'll go take off somewhere abroad to study. And that like for us now you're on this IFS salary. So they're like, okay, now you kind of have to make your own way. We have to pay for college and you're absolutely going to college. But then by the time my results came out, I didn't have time to like to apply to a Steve Fins. And I probably frankly sure. didn't have the grades either. So I went to an all girls college after that called Metri Devi, um, which was down the street from the British school. And corrupted everyone there. No, I was completely, I was terrified. I was not used to an environment where there's only girls. Uh, I couldn't really connect or relate with anyone. Nobody understood why I had an accent. And so I, you know, I remember just, uh, and sorry, mom, furiously started smoking cigarettes behind cup. <laughs> and that's where I made all my friends. Um, and I remember then I sort of joined the, the, the fashion team and the choreography team and theater and started doing that. And I think that was kind of the turning point for me because I remember being so upset that I was supposed to go to the American University of Paris and what is my life at this college and really upset about it. Um, and then we had, you know, used to have these inter-college competitions. Sure. And so they asked me to participate because I was a good dancer. And, and the person who was teaching our college was this lady called Ronica Jacob. And she had a troupe called Ronica Jacob and the Planets. So kind of like the Shama Gower of death. Sure. And uh, she, she asked me if I want to join the troupe. And so suddenly I was making a thousand rupees a show, which back at that time was a lot of money, right? Um, and so then I, that's how I started my career in this whole industry That's as, interesting. as a backup dancer. So none of your academics. It did nothing. <laughs> it did but there's nothing. a story there, right? There's a story yeah, there. Yeah. I said at the beginning, at the top of this show, I said, yeah. you know, that very often we get kind of, how shall I say, channelized wrongly. For sure. You know, based on societal pressures and parental pressures yeah. and the likes. We, we, we stop to really look internally, you know, take of that long hard look in the mirror, figure who we are. And yeah. then give, you know, kind no, of... No, I think also, I genuinely feel, I feel like as a society and a culture, we've gone a little off the rails, right? We've gotten so caught up in how much money you make, your fame, your fortune, sure. academics. But I mean, let's be honest, we're all on this planet for a very limited speck of time, sure. right? So there's a, there's a great show I was just watching on Netflix yesterday about um, the universe and, 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 uh, and manifestation and all of that. And it literally is the fact that we're here. And, you know, it's that old saying, right? That you go with nothing, you come with anything, right? Sure. Nothing, all of that. So what are we so caught up about? You're not going to leave with any of this money. You know? so, but, but there is a line from a movie called Moulin Rouge that I love that says the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. And it's not just romantic love. It's love for what you do, your friends, your family, whatever that is. So if that was, and I often ask people this, if I told you that the most valuable currency of the world is love and positivity, ask yourself how much are you worth in that? You know, if it's not academics, if it's not fame, if it's not money. That's a really interesting line. Really? Can, can you say it to us again? Yeah. So, so if, I, if I told you that if I, if I said that the greatest currency on the planet today is not fame, fortune and money, if it's love and positivity, how much are you worth? I don't know if you remember this, but we've met a few times, right? Of course I do. And on one of the occasions, you spoke about happiness. Mm. And I held on to that because, you yeah. know, that's really something I think about all the time. Uh, who's the real me? And I, I often say that I'm all about chasing happiness. And if that means going unconventional route, sure. Say la vie, so be it. Mm. I speak a bit of French as well. Nice. You heard me say that. I understood. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> okay, so we know a bit about your growing up years. Mm. But what really intrigues me, and I'm sure the world around me, mm. Marani, is 
the number of things you've thrown yourself at. A radio jock. Um, yeah. And I always say, Brian, my, you know, radio is my first love and blogging my marriage. <laughs> Literally, I think there's something about the theater of the mind, you know, the visions you can conjure up. Uh, I, I mean, I will tell you a couple of anecdotes growing up that stayed with me, and I think they really have shaped who I am. So when we were posted to Lebanon, it was during the war, it was the, during the civil war, and we were evacuated out. But we spent about a month sleeping in the basement. And every morning we would collect bullet shells from our bedrooms so because the glasses yeah. would be shattered. And the whole road in front of our house once crumbled into the basketball court of the school in front of us. But what I thought was super interesting about what my parents did is they did a very, uh, life is beautiful for me. They made it into a game. Because I was five, so I didn't really know uh, the gravitas of war. And it was kind of like, okay, let's go in the morning and see who got the most bullet shells in their room. Oh. And looking back, I'm like, I must say, and I, I know my father developed diabetes from the stress because he was the ambassador, so he was the last one to leave. I remember we took like a dinghy boat uh, from Damascus and were sort of evacuated out. I remember one random night we were out past curfew, I think late lunch, and we spent the night in the same basement as Yasser Arafat, like looking back. And you know, now when I think about these things, I'm like, I can't believe all of these things happened in my life, you know, and, and I've just, it just feels like another life. And I think a lot of who I am has been shaped by these experiences. Growing up, my best friend was Korean and look at K-pop culture now and I'm thinking back to the fact that I probably, probably was introduced to K-pop before it was a popular thing yeah. to, to like, you know, and I loved it. And I remember dancing around in her room when I was 14 year old, 14 year, 40 year old uh, to that music and just having extraordinary um, experiences. And it's all, you know, courtesy of my, my parents. But I think that really also shaped what ended up happening and how I ended up doing all the things that I did. Like I said, I was a backup dancer for Sukhbir and um, for all the indie pop stars. So you name it, Namika, Dilair, Mendy. Uh, but there was one year, there was a Channel V Awards, I think in the year 2000. And on the same show, I danced behind the Lair Mendy, Sukhbir, Peter Andre, and the Spice Girls. I was there at the show. We were we helping were, put yes, it together. Yeah. Right. And I remember <laughs> walking around thinking, this is the coolest my life is ever going to get. Because yes. This is what I've peaked. And it was just the most amazing feeling. I, you know, you're rolling back the years. And yeah, you really, yeah. really got me into it now. Yeah. I can remember watching Peter Andre sing Mysterious Girl. Yeah. He was our Justin Bieber guys. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he did a duet. You know, I think it was with one of the Indian singers. It wasn't Jasmine. It was yeah, Anida. Yeah, Anida. Yeah. Anida did it with her. And I know Shamak did a duet with Sting. I think it was Every Breath You Take, where they did a verse in Hindi and a verse in English. And, and half of me was dying, I must be honest. Of course. Saying, what are you doing to the song, you know? And the other half was, you know, was saying, hey, interesting. But you know what I used to love? And I always, and I, I, I remember because I'm from that generation of, when VJs was the cool career. So sure. I remember thinking, what I want to do, I want to be a VJ. And I remember auditioning in, in Delhi. I remember when I first came to Bombay. I, and then because I was dancing, I used to end up doing all these Pepsi Dance Connections or Channel V Road shows. So I would run into these like cool cat characters who before social media influencers were the cool kids. You know, these VJs who had like cool hair and sunglasses and the bomber jackets. And I'm like, that's what I want to be. How do you do that? And I remember thinking, you know, Okay, let me see. And then I, you know, I ended up going with one, like with an ex-boyfriend back in the day. He went to audition to host one of those college fests. You know, they used to have these little Pepsi yeah. booths. Uh, and I went with him and I just was keeping him company. But then they were like, do you want to audition as well? And I got the gig and we used to get paid 500 rupees a day. Right, I've money. done all of this. Pragati Medan in Delhi, I have stood next to those cars. The Honda, the Cielo, stood there in like a little Honda dress, handing out pamphlets. And, um, more power to you, and lady. It was more great. power and to those you. were like some epic days. I remember we did a 49-hour train ride to Cochin. And this is some like spoiled Diplo Brad who's never really done like a train. And they're like just and they were like just train with charge on. And I didn't understand this concept, right? Because I'm like, surely there's like a dedicated seat. But not when you have like the the waitlist yeah. seats. And I'm like, we're gonna be on this train for two days and we don't have anywhere to sleep. And I remember crying and one of the dancers, he played the violin, Sanjeev, so he played the violin for the ticket master so that he would give us a bogey like a seat for us to sleep in and I remember we arrived there it was for a Namika show and uh, when we got off the train after two days you know she handed us all a thousand rupees and said this is like a bonus but then she cut half of it from her salary later I told her one later I was like that's horrifying but we used to do all these crazy things I've danced in front of uh, they, they used to have this road show the Panasonic road show yeah. so they would have the Panasonic TVs on this truck and all the dancers would come out and dance in front of it and do a flare and then go again I used to, I've done for six years, we used to do crazy things. Go to Patan Code and all of Punjab, just dancing. You're, you're an author. 
as yes, well. Yes, yes. Have you captured these experiences? I have. It's a book I wrote called To the Moon, How I Blogged so, My Way to Bollywood. So it's all in there. I'm actually working on my second book now. I'm 8,000 words away from finishing it. Ah, so say that again. I want the listeners to actually pick up that book, the name Let's of the book. See. It's called To the Moon. I'll tell you why. Um, to the Moon, How I Blogged My Way to Bollywood. To the Moon, because I have this tattoo. And there's a movie called Catch Me If You Can. And so that Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. movie. And in the movie, his father always says this line, to the moon, to the moon. And something about it I really liked, even though now we're so much further than the moon. Um, so I, I called it that. And one of the things, the insights I realized in life is all these random little things that you say to yourself or you think are quirky and catchy and fun that you think people will find stupid. Hold on to those. Because as I wrote my book, I never thought that these random little anecdotes will make it into a, a book one day, you know? Um, and that's what makes you uniquely you. It's ironically say that I'm in the process of uh, of writing one myself. Oh wow! Congratulations. And it's it's based around the same yeah. vibe. It's hashtag working title. Nice. Hashtag live that dream. Live that dream. Yeah. You know, and it's pretty much what you're saying. It's, it is. You know, it's about it's about living in the moment, but it's about charting your course based on happiness. Yeah fulfillment rather than what society whatever tells you they to tell do. you to do and honestly like i mean i'm pretty lucky that my parents were never like difficult about me being a backup dancer you know i remember i, I do remember though when i sent my father a copy of the book to read and say okay will you write something for me he first he was horrified he goes but i gave you such a great education how can you talk about struggling in bombay and coming and not knowing anyone having no money i was like no but read the whole book you know like it's a story of great you know inspiration and then he got it later but I mean, I remember, you know, I, I, I didn't really have a plan. I was dancing six right. years in. My, my mom jokingly once said, do you want to get a real job? Well, my sister's at Cambridge. My brother's got a company. I, I hear you clearly because that's a question that got thrown at me very often. Yeah. I mean, what's this event thingy that you're doing? Yeah? yeah, of course. Or this anchoring bit, you know. Aren't you, shouldn't you be beyond hosting shows now? Yeah. It was almost kind of condescended towards. Of you know? course, yeah. I want to touch on another, you know, question, and I'm really intrigued to know your thought. Obviously, we live life chasing happiness, chasing fulfillment, but there are challenges. Life ain't easy. Yeah? Of course. And uh, there are challenges that come at you every once, maybe every twice in a while. Yeah. I'm very intrigued to know challenges that, that you came across and what was your approach and so honestly, for me, again, like I said, I, you know, even though I was, you know, out of like a fancy school, like the British school where everyone has a lot of money, I didn't have that kind of money. So I didn't go to the fancy parties. I still remember and my mom was very particular about not spoiling me, right? After spoiling me for 17 years, yes. the strategy was very flawed. Um, but I would like literally get, and I, in college, I would get 50 rupees a day, max, like that's it. And so then I could choose that in the canteen what I have. And I still remember clearly, I could either have a Coke and a sandwich or I could have a vara pao. And it's the most, it was like a very complex, like, I really have to think about what you're going to spend the money sure. on. Um, and so when I started earning my own money, suddenly I was like, and you know what, what my biggest flex used to be? Uh, on Christmas, I would go to the coffee shop at the Machan at like a, a fancy hotel and have a chocolate pastry for that was 400 rupees. Big was moment. Big moment. That's a lot of money to spend. Because you used to grow up watching these movies or all, you know, like, you know, and I think I was watching the romantics that, you know, people really go sit in a five star hotel coffee shop and eat a pastry and drink a coffee. And I'm like, I want to be one of those people. Uh, and that's what I used to spend my money on. It just, just go and see the Christmas tree. And, um, but I think that what, what was interesting is what had started just about coming around was the, the first dot-com boom. So I remember somebody said they're looking for someone to write uh, for a company called Asia Telenet. And they, they're doing a portal, a, a city portal, where they're going to talk about things to do in Delhi. And I've always been a, you know, a writer on the side. And I, you'll know this reference. Yeah. I, I got published in Reader's Digest, which was such a big deal for me growing up. Now nobody knows about that magazine anymore or Target. I was just always used to write. So I was like, okay, I'll go write. And, and, and I walked, but I still remember walking in and my Doc Martens and my dancer pants and like, a, you know, my, my spaghetti strap top with my bra showing. And I'm sure everyone yeah, yeah. was Ooh, like, what is this? That? And who is, yeah. who is coming like this? And I, every, I realized everyone's like wearing shirts. And I was like, mm, maybe I need a new wardrobe. And I remember going, I used to get paid 5,000 rupees a month. That was my salary. And I was like, okay, great, I'll do this. And one random weekend, I came to Bombay um, just to visit my friend. And she was working with Pralat Kakkar, my friend, ah, yeah. at Genesis. And I came and I remember landing and it was raining and I got into a black and yellow. And I was just blown away by the vibe of the city, you know, that there were neon lights. You could see the reflection in the puddles, there was wind in my hair. 
I think I'd had just like some very tragic breakup. So it really felt like my own little Bollywood movies playing in my head. And I think everyone has that feeling. I was like, I need to move here. Uh, now, I had no concept of how expensive it is to live here. I had 40,000 rupees in my bank account. And just like I think a month before that, I had decided to run away from home very dramatically because I had a fight with my mother. You did? I did. And I got as far as the Machan coffee shop, which seems to be my spot. And then I realized that I've really not thought this through. So I have to like really sheepishly go home. And my mom was just like, next time take a tea, don't bring the bus. <laughs> and I remember the city, I was 21 years old. And I, I, again, I look back and say props to her for letting me go. Because Indian parents especially can be so protective or so sure. concerned. Like, how can I let my single daughter go? And I said, let me try. And maybe they thought I wouldn't make it and I'll, she'll be back or whatever. But she, she said, okay. And looking back now, I'm like, it's amazing that she let a 20 or one year old girl move to Bombay on her own because I had one friend, Nikki, but she was my best friend. So they knew the parents and everything. Um, and I uh, moved into this house in Andheri, which had, I used to live with six other girls and my rent was 600 rupees. You just imagine what this apartment must have been like. And at night, there used to be this one like corner of the AC that had a little hole in it. So this pigeon would come in every night and fly around and I would sleep like traumatized with a sheet over my head thinking this pigeon's going to hit the fan and there's going to be blood everywhere. So, you know, most Bollywood movies, the pigeon is this romantic hero character element, you know. Mine was just a <laughs> horror movie and I kept thinking, I can't live like this anymore. And so I was, you know, and, and I remember meeting Prahlad and telling me, he told me, he said, um, she said, come, I'll introduce you. And I, two things happened. One day he said, why don't you work on my set? You know, he gives new people a chance. Sure. And the first job I had was on a Cadbury commercial set where there was this little kid who was supposed to eat chocolate and say some like, and this little kid had been eating so much chocolate that they were worried he's going to throw up. And Prahlad is like, you cannot, nothing can fall in the set. So if he does throw up, you have to catch it. And I was like, no way am I That's doing so that? That's so Prahlad, isn't it? It's so Prahlad. Luckily, this kid didn't throw up, but I was on my hands and knees on the floor saying, <laughs> I didn't come here to do this. I was like, I'm not cut out for this. And then I remember going to audition again to be a VJ. I remember, I used to, and the thing is, I think now I look back and I'm like, very proud of myself that I had the confidence to walk into the MTV office, very poorly with five Kodak prints, like, just random pictures from a holiday somewhere and say I want to be a VJ uh, they sat with me for like a nice kind five minutes and then they sent me on my way and they never called me and, uh, and years later I worked at MTV and I, 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 know. I know what we used to think of those people who walked in thinking yeah. they're going to be a VJ but then it's so ironic because years later I had my own you know show on, on Viacom but then again I remember going for another audition and that time Nikki knew a makeup artist so she said listen why don't you go get your makeup done and then go and audition so I did. And so I must have looked really good. And I got through and they're like, great. And they wrote all these great notes. Um, and and I was, so then I was called for the second one. And I remember also in Delhi, I remember auditioning and someone had written, there's something there. And I was so happy that ah. they said, there's something there. And then I went for the second audition and it was at Sun and Sand. And Carol Gracious was there as well. And they, and they were like, okay. And they had said, bring some bikini tops and shorts and stuff. And I was like, I don't really have great clothes. But Carol was so sweet. She goes, why don't you just wear, even though we've come for the same audition, right? She was really sweet about it. And, but that's when I realized that they weren't really just looking for VJs. They were looking for models. So while I did the whole move, walk came out of the pool, they were like, with, got all my lines right. They said, you have the gift of gab, but stop short of saying you don't have the look. So I didn't want to be a VJ anymore. And I think Prahlad called this because I, when I met him, I said, I want to be a VJ. And he goes, what else do you want to do? Immediately. Oh, is that right? Immediately. He was, I, and I was like, I should have been shattered. But he was like, what else? And I said, I like to write. And I remember he picked up the phone and he said, um, listen, I'm sending this girl uh, for, uh, for a copywriter and you see. And I don't know if I went and got that job or what happened, but I was like, yeah, I like to write. Let's see. And then um, I ended up working at a company called Activate Technologies. Now, Midday had decided, kind of ahead of its time, to start a website called Chalo Mumbai. Oh. And so being the nerd that I am, I sort of wrote the Bible for, OK, what should be on their website? What are the sections? And I kept, you know, sort of enhancing that. And at that point, I was again working for some 6,000 rupees and then I was moved to a place where it used to rain inside my apartment. <laughs> Bungalow next to a bar called Rain in Juhu. No lack of really... excitement in your life. Seriously, Mark. when I think about it. And, and then I remember um, I got another job at a company called Ideas for You. And this was my, by far the most hilarious job I've ever done. My job was to go to Vijay Sales every day and write fake reviews about washing machines. So I would go and I would look at the pamphlets and like say, okay, this has this much spin cycle and that. And I would fill in this on ideas. We used to write all these reviews. That's what I used to do. <clears throat> and I remember then midday said, okay, let's do the project. So then they hired me back and they had to give me a bump from 5,000 to 18,000 because I was able to negotiate. That's huge. Huge. And ironically, because I started working with the midday, they're the ones who had the first radio station. That's right. Um, 
But it's it's so funny because when I started doing that, that that didn't even happen immediately. From that Chalo Mumbai moment, some, again, I was leaving that job. Um, I got called for a, a company, some called Asia, to, um, Asia Content. And I didn't know what they do. I was like, yeah, I'll go get a writing job. And when I sat down for the interview, the guy said, look, I'll be honest with you, you were looking for someone to write all the romance content for MTVIndia.com. And I thought, you're going to pay me to write about love all day? That's amazing. And they said, you have very, you know, uh, big shoes to fill because Rajesh Tahil's wife used to do that before. That's right. And I remember then the first dot-com bubble burst. So there were 15 of us working here. And they said, uh, okay, now, you know, party's over. Only four of you can remain. Luckily, I still had a job. They marched us into the same empty of the office that I had come to years before to audition. And there used to be a basketball court in the middle. Nice to sit there and just write content for the website. And one day, Cyrus Oshidar asked me, he's like, uh, so what do you do here? I said, I work on the website. He said, can you write promos? And I don't know what that was. But then I learned later it was those five lines that, yes. have you seen the best, the most amazing? And he paid me 2,000 rupees per script. And I was like, this is amazing. That's where I met all the promos team and all these guys. And that's when they told me that, you know, all these aspiring wannabe VJs, they walk in, when they walk out, we hold up numbers to each other to score <laughs> them. <laughs> and I was like, I don't even want to know what I would have gotten. But it was so funny that it was full circle there. And then one of the things I've also learned is that Never uh, underestimate what can happen through a random connection or a random lunch break. Because one of the guys who was working with me at um, MTVIndia.com, this guy who started, ended up, ended up starting Marching Ants in uh -huh. the exercise, the Raji. Yes. Yes. He said that, hey, listen, private radio is starting. Why don't you go audition? Because you have like a nice voice. So I remember leaving one lunch break and going to win 94.6 to audition. And I got the job to be a, a radio jockey suddenly. I remember that but so clearly. Such a, you know, ages ago. And these were the first commercial radio stations. And again, it's so ironic, Brian, because years before I had gone to audition at All India Radio in Delhi. And they rejected me because they said I roll my R's too much. So I was like, okay, it all happens when it's meant to. And um, I remember having this great dilemma saying, okay, I, I can either become freelance radio jockey and give up a, you know, a month to month paycheck. And I'm Marwari, so we don't do that, right? We don't freelance. Um, but then I remember Aditya Patwardhan, who was the programming director, said, you're making a big mistake by not taking this opportunity because you have a talent. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll jump ship. And then I ended up working with Russian Abbas and everyone who worked at Win 94.6. But then I really wanted to work at the cool station, which was Go 92.5. You yes. know, the sound of Mumbai with all of these guys who then eventually was like Tariq, Jangutra, the whole gang. And we were that cool station. I remember I used to do a show called Two to Five. And then I got upgraded to the drive, evening drive show, which was Horn OK, please, 6 to 9 p.m. Um, and I think I was a radio jockey for nine years. It was like probably the most fun time because it's just the being live on radio, people listening. It's, you know, it, it's pre-social media, that whole interaction or someone calling in or sending a message in. And I used to spend a lot of time with a lot of these people at Ghetto. And one day someone told me, hey, why don't you um, join Twitter? I think you'll like it. This guy, Rohit Gupta. And I was like, OK. So I started to use Twitter along with my radio show, instead of just a dial-in line, I would say, you can tweet me at Miss Malini um, if you want to. And, and what was funny is while I was, I was, I was working at radio, they, they said, because midday on the radio station, sure. they said, we, we're going to start a column. That's where Rajesh Tahil gave me a column. He said, why don't you start a column writing about nightlife and parties and culture? Uh, and they called it Malini's Mumbai. Ah. Bef way before Miss Malini. I always liked the alliteration. So I used to go to like different things and I would write about parties and music and all of that. But whenever it would go to edit, they would chop it down to just bold celebrity names, a couple of pictures and this. And I'm like, what about all this like beautiful writing I've submitted? Uh, so a friend of mine, I remember 2008, I was in Dubai with him, Karin Wadera. He said, why don't you start a blog? And I said, what's a blog? What's the name again? Karin Wadera. Uh. Yeah. And he said, uh, so I said, but who reads it? He said, it's like his online diary. And he said, don't worry about it. And I remember May 5th, 2008, he made me a WordPress Your login. Your memory is disgusting. Because it's just the, like, what? Let's imagine my life has just changed from all of that. I'm sitting here because of this. And I didn't, and it was free. So it wasn't even missmalini.com. It was www.wordpress.missmalini.com. And I would, and I remember just loving that feeling. You know, that feeling used yeah. to get on radio when you're playing a song and you get, you get your timing just right where the music ends and you put the faders yeah. up and the lyrics start. It was that feeling. And I remember when I left radio after nine years, it, I was the saddest I think I've ever been in my life. I thought I'll never, I remember playing Wochali, the faders up last <laughs> song and thinking this is horrifying. But I only felt like this again at that point. And here's where Twitter comes in. 
I remember one day, so you know me here, Joshi, of course, yes. all the old RJs. He tweeted once, randomly, Imran Khan, the actor, saying, hey, you should listen to Malini's show. She plays music you like. Because I, I used to get to sneak in a lot more English music on my show. Uh, I used to have a show called Malini to Midnight. Then I had a show sponsored by Tiger, Tiger Beer called Tiger Time with Miss Malini. Um, so whenever I would ask my friend, what time is it? They would say, Tiger Time. <laughs> right. um, and I remember, he, you know, I, he tweeted Imran. And so, I mean, not thinking anything of it, I replied saying, hey, Imran, you should come to the studio sometime. Just like a random, like, I was not going to come to the studio. And he said, deal, as long as you call your show Pirate Radio when you do that. And I didn't know why. And he explained to me, he said, the concept of Pirate Radio is that, uh, you know, back in the 80s, they would not be allowed to play pop music unless they were offshore. So they would have these boats where they would have radio stations. And so he gave me a copy of the movie. It was a DVD. This is when we had our DVDs and VCR players and all of that. And so he came to the studio, a Bollywood actor, and I have no connection to Bollywood at all, right? And he came and he sat from nine till midnight and we just played his oh. 40 favorite English songs. So he introduced me to some great songs. Like there's a song that, um, it's called David Duchovny. It's, a, it's by a stalker who says, David Duchovny, why don't you love me? I'm going to kill Scully. And he just had such a great sense of music. And we didn't talk about anything to do with um, Bollywood. And I thought, this is amazing. And so then the next week I tweeted, Rahul Khanna. And I was like, look, I do this thing where we don't talk about Bollywood and you can come and play your favorite songs. And he said, yes. And then I messaged Farhan uh, uh, Akhtar on Facebook and he replied. And I was like, how is it possible that these people are replying? One, I realized, I think it's because I went straight to the source and not through some yeah. management. And so that's how this whole thing was born. And because I had started the blog, I used to have this little flip video camera and they would sit, and these videos are still on YouTube. I would sit and record them while they spoke. And I would put it up on my blog. And this is the first iteration of the whole, you know, YouTube channel. I was going to ask. I was going to ask. So obviously you were forward thinking whether you thought so. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, okay, YouTube, anything new. I was like, okay, let me try it. I still remember because, you know, I I loved all this Bollywood stuff. And I didn't have a setup like, you know, here now you have the three camera set up and the ring light and everything. I used to live at Reva Bungalow, which is like this little, you know, one ping, one room ping. Yes. I used to have a curtain that I would just draw behind me. I would prop up my, like, and no, not a phone because I didn't have a smartphone. It was like a proper, like a camera, like a little Kodak camera um, or the little flip camera. I would put the midday newspaper behind it and then I would record myself reading out the latest headlines from Bollywood and I would upload it on YouTube. And that's how I started. And this is how it. many years ago? 15 years ago. So there you go. Oh. There you go. You were, you were ahead of your time. Yeah. You know, and, and that's... The top, that's what I want to kind of spend some time on. Sure. Most of us live in the moment and that's great. But we're so involved or consumed by what we do that we don't spend enough time yeah. thinking about where we are going or where we should be going and whether it sits within our passion points, you know, or our happiness quotient. Yeah. And you've always found... You know what I think it is? I think, you know, there's this great Japanese concept called Ikigai. Yeah. And I realized later on that I think I've always just automatically accidentally followed this. So Ikigai has four pillars, right? So it's what do you love to do? What are you good at? Uh, what can you be paid to do? And what does the world need? And I've always kind of been someone who follows my heart. So honestly, and it's really ironic. So I first moved to Bombay because I Came here, and loved the city, but I also met a boy. So I didn't marry him, but thanks, Dinesh, for all of this. Um, and I ended up, you know, ended up moving and changing my life here because I've sort of followed my joy and instinct rather than having to follow a cookie cutter path. And you, you have, I mean, I'm very blessed that my family didn't give me grief about it or didn't have these expectations. Go, maybe they also thought that, well, she, you know, we already have two that are like super achievers. It's fine. They'll figure it out. But I think that what it is, is, if you, if you spend, and this is what I always try to tell people as well, don't focus on the end goal, right? Be present. Do, do you now? Because if you think about it, forever is made up of a series of nows. There's no yesterday. Tomorrow never comes, right? And social media makes it harder and harder to live in the present, which I know. Sure. Which is one thing that I've seen over the last 15 years. But I think that there's such an interesting concept. So I, I, I was struggling to finish my second book. And then I ran into this guy who's the founder of Quorum. And he told me about the Dunbar number. Have you heard about the Dunbar number? Yeah. Which says that at any given point, cognitively as human beings, we can have 150 meaningful relationships at any given time. 
five close friends, 50 acquaintances, 150 more, which is why most weddings are about 150 people, which is why a lot of times you'll meet someone and you won't remember them or they won't remember you and you'll say, I'm so sorry. It's because psych- you know, psychologically, we're not capable of more than 150 meaningful relationships. Now you throw social media into this mix and the numbers are, and if you think about it now, what, what do we do? We open social media and we look at that number. How many likes? How many people have seen it? Do you even know who they are? You know, so um, the concept that I'm trying to unpack in my book, which second book is coming out soon, it's called Under the Influence. Um, And it's really about saying unsee the numbers and see the people again. Because if you start relating to what what the way that it works, right? Right now, if you put up a post, you put up a video and you're like, you got 100 likes. You'd be like, only 100? That's nothing. Like, it didn't do well. But if 100 people were in this room right now clapping or saying they liked you or saying they enjoyed something, that's a great feeling. Overjoyed. Yeah. It's because we've dehumanized each other that we no longer value that person. Oh, that's such an interesting perspective. Yeah. Well, what, what's also interesting, Malini, is that, well, you know, the last swatch of time has convinced us, not that we weren't earlier, that you're deeply passionate. You're in love with who you are and what you do, yeah. importantly. And that doesn't normally marry entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. Now you're one young lady who embraces and and kicks butt at both. That's very kind. I think, you know, honestly what it is is two things, right? One, now the, there are words for it. Content creator, influencer, right. social media. I used to jokingly call myself a social media Jedi. And I used to say I'm building my empire mostly because I really love Star Wars, not that person. Like the whole universe of that. But I feel like I, and I'll tell you, when you were talking about struggles, one of the, sec- the struggles that I had is when I started doing this. And because, again, I was very well aware that I'm not VJ material or a model. So I never fancied myself coming onto social media, being a Bollywood actor or being Kim Kardashian. I'm not particularly into, like, I don't know how to do my own makeup or fashion. Or... So I, I had a bit of an identity crisis because I, you know, came online. I was creating these social media handles. But I'm like, I, who am I, right? Because we condition ourselves to believe that you must have some sort of role model or path to follow. But I didn't have one, right? I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not, I can't see the path because nobody else has done what I'm trying to do here. I used to like websites like Perez Hilton or Just Jared. Right. And my idols are like Oprah, Ariana Huffington. And that's when the penny dropped where I'm like, you know, well, maybe I don't have to be like anyone else. And as soon as I did that, it really freed me of all the shackles of, am I putting enough beauty content out? Am I the right person for this? Do I feel like I'm being disingenuous because I'm talking about things I don't know sure. about? And that's when I decided that my voice is going to, I created this little anime and avatar who's going to do well on Metaverse, I feel. And I also thought she was just going to age better than I will. And I like the iteration of, you know, sure. alliteration of Miss Malini. And I wanted to, and again, this digs so far back into my childhood. The reason why I think I even did this is because when I moved back to India at the age of 17 and then Bombay at 21, I saw a different India than people think about when they you or growing up that I could claim to. The reason why someone at the age of nine asked me if I go to school on an elephant is because they might have had an exp- experience of watching, um, you know, Discovery Channel or National Geographic or Slumdog Millionaire, which is very much exists. But where is the document of my modern India today, where now there are 46 million creators, where there is affluence and Bollywood and luxury and passion. And I think that's kind of why I started the blog. I just wanted to document for the world to see on the internet the India that I live in, that is not just, you know, villages and sure. Maharajas. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and you're seeing this change coming, right? Slowly people are being more aware of it. Now we're seeing more brown people in leading roles. But the India that I came back to and grew up in, it was, it was even for me quite a shock because yeah. I didn't know that this is what's happening in Bombay. You know, we, people have come to India with a completely different version. So I think net net, the reason why this was successful is because one, People are mad surprised that there's so much evolution when it comes to technology and all of that from India. And I remember one of the first things that happened, I was writing, I started writing my blog. I had no expectation of making any money out of it. But I remember I got a, an email from the One Drop Foundation and they were going to do this big reveal where they were sending some, some Red Bull sponsored thing to outer space. And they said, if you write about this on your blog, we'll send you a video camera. And I showed my husband, now my husband, boyfriend, he's like, this must be a scam, right? One of those like send money to Nigeria kind of emails. Um, and 
But then I said, okay, and they did it. They sent me this little flip camera, this video camera that I used to had a USB and that's what I used to record all my content on. Now, here's what happened to me here in India. You have the big guys with the big cameras who are the paparazzi. Right. And suddenly here, up here I was, this little, you know, young girl who's there with this little camera. So they couldn't really figure out what to make of me. But as a result, they'd be like, chalo, tika, tika, bit, mm. I go in front, it's fine. And I think most people thought I'm just fangirling there to take a picture. And it all evolved. And because no one else had done it, I could do it my way. And I still remember the first thing that it was all barter for one year. I remember that Levi's mailed me and said, we'll give you a pair of jeans if you blog about this. And we'll fly you to Delhi. And I was like, that's amazing. I want to go to Delhi, stay in a five-star hotel. And so all this, all the luxuries that I had, sure. had growing up because of my father, I was finally earning on my own in a sense, but it was all barter. And I still remember, it's so funny because I remember documenting my wedding on the blog for fun as the domestically challenged Desi bride. And getting so much flack for talking about a brand that decided to give away sunscreen at my wedding. And they're like, how can you do that? How can you get, you know, a product for this? And now it's a whole industry. I know. Like wedding blogs are like a whole thing. So it's so funny because I didn't know that I was doing this. And that's why I always tell a lot of people that don't get into this thinking, okay, how do I make money from it? Because that's where you, you know, it, the passion falls apart. That's where your uh, intent gets So you skewed. believe it's one or the other? No, I think you can do both, but I think never start anything with this thought. I resonate big time with that. Yeah. I'm doing a couple of things now and I'm wondering why I am doing it. And the answer is pretty clearly. Yeah. That that's where my passion and my yeah. my vibe is. Yeah. And like I said at the, you know, the top of the show, if you're really doing what brings you happiness, what brings you joy, what brings you fulfillment, the rest, including monies, kind of falls in line. There's a great, there's an internet sage uh, called Jason Silva and he does these inspirational videos and he talks about passion. And again, it all comes down to this ikigai. He says, write down the 15 things that you're most curious about or interested in. And a, just like in a beautiful mind, some of them will pop out at yeah. you. Uh, and th at the core of that is where the neuroscience is. That's where your, your passion point is. And very often you will find in your own, you know, vein, you will feel if you're not doing something according to your path or passion, if you're not following your true north, you're, 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 there's something inside you that will give you that indication. And you'll tell yourself, you know, we grew up in a generation where you're not supposed to love your job. It's supposed to pay the bills. Yeah. That was hammered in every day. What's your job? What do you expect? And how right? far from the truth is that? Exactly. And that's why, you know, it's a cliched line, but it's true. Like, you know, you love what you do. You'll never work a day in your life. That's right. And that is what you should be chasing. And, you know, I always tell all the young women that I mentor as well that, you know, we live in a time where you can make anything your career. You want to be a makeup artist. You want to be a sneaker designer. And, you know, there are careers in the, the coming up in the future for Gen Alpha, which is the one after sure. Gen Z, um, that don't yet exist. There's going to be ushers for, you know, flights to the moon, right? F further than the moon, probably, right? There's going to be all of this that's happening. So you can make anything your career, your passion. Um, and so, you know, sort of, it's that seize the day. It's really, it's yeah. really out of that. What's really interesting is you speak of mentoring. I, I, I get your vibe about how you draw the balance between entrepreneurship and passion points. I mm. mean, that came through really strongly. On the mentorship, are you also open to mentoring uh, aging men? <laughs> Just ask me. I, I don't think you need any mentoring, <laughs> Brian. I think you're good to go. You are most kind. Now, which brings me to what I'd love to hear about from you. Uh, it's something we normally do at the end of a chat with people who have so much to share. Mm. And I'm going to sound a little cliched, but I just wish this was a two-part episode because there's tons more to genuinely chat about and importantly share yeah. with the world outside. But, you know, I was a big, big uh, believer, so to speak, on the top right, you know, of the, of the board in class. You know, the model. Moral, yeah. Moral, moral of, of the, the day. Yeah, or yeah, moral yeah. Of the, and in the book, the model of the story. Mm -hmm. And I do believe all of us have this central conviction yeah. uh, of belief slash sharing, right? And I'd like for you uh, to share with everyone who's going to be tuning in or who is tuned in as to what that central thought, central belief, central bit of advice, whatever you wish to call it, is in your mind. Sure. All right, here goes. <laughs> so people often ask me how to be a rich and famous blogger. And I tell them, stop, step back. First of all, don't try to be a rich and famous anything. 
close your eyes and think about the one thing that you would do willingly for the rest of your life, even if nobody paid you to do it. And make that your career and fame and fortune will surely follow. Oh, man. Can I do it just now? I want to be Miss Malini. What a good choice. <laughs> but seriously, what an incredible chat, Malini. What an incredible chat. Thank you chat. so much for having me. I am deadly serious about a volume two on this one whenever opportunity provides. But thank you for volume one. Thank you for it having truly me. It truly was. No, it's it so really. nice and nostalgic as well. So I many know. of my references today, I'm like, no, they're not going to understand. <laughs> No, absolute privilege, nothing short. Uh, and like we always do at Tell Us Like It Is, I'm sure we have some wonderful, wonderful insights into what makes Malini Agarwal, Miss Malini, have a as you wish by way of name, the wonderful person she is. Thanks for tuning in to Tell Us Like It Is, and we promise you more such in the future. Cheers. Cheers.